Welcome to your vote 2022 ACPM's weekly look at the candidates and the issues. I'm Liliana Soto. Southern Arizona has two congressional districts. The sixth, we met those candidates last week, and the seventh, we'll introduce you to those candidates shortly. The seventh congressional district stretches across almost the entire Arizona-Mexico border, beginning in Yuma and including Bisbee and Douglas in Southern Cochise County. It also stretches into Maricopa County. Like all of the other congressional districts, it is new this year. But the core of it has been represented by Democratic Congressman Raul Grijalva since 2003. He's here with ACPM's Christopher Conover. Thanks, Lily. Congressman, if you're reelected, what's the first bill you file when you get back to Washington? Well, it depends on the majority minority status, to be quite honest with you. But, you know, uh, there's some uh, there's some pieces of legislation that that have been eternal, to say the least, and that would be the Grand Canyon Protection Act. If 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 the, if the president uh, has it moved on on something some different designation uh, to protect the the Grand Canyon, that Colorado water source from uh, uranium mining and mining in general, uh, a, a real threat to that. And then the other one, because I think it it's important for Arizona to protect that source. The other uh, issue is having to do with indigenous communities and having a codified consultation process uh, in media, uh, for tribes across this country. And then I, then I think, uh, depending on where we're at, uh, in majority minority, you know, sometimes we're, we're asked, what is the good piece of legislation that you passed? And we can talk about that. I'm proud of some, some, some. But also sometimes, particularly the four years with Trump, it was about keeping the worst from happening and actually stopping legislation and other items. So it's it's a combination of work. So it depends on what, what our status is. Like, I think we'll find ourselves, if we're in the majority, reintroducing bills that we think are powerful and need to be heard, environmental justice for all, uh, to protect uh, environmental justice communities, and, and the list goes on. But for now, I think uh, uh, that's that's going to say a lot because it's the mode that you're in. You're you're either in a governing mode or you're keeping uh, some of the worst things from happening, and we certainly saw that under Trump. The seventh congressional district is the big border district for Arizona. You have Yuma, and now with the redraw, you have border towns in Cochise County. Apprehensions record high this year, according to Border Patrol. What is it the federal government needs to do? The federal government needs to do, and, and what Congress needs to do, which is the impediment to getting anything done, is, is, is you know, I understand immigration in the border. I don't understand it, but it, it, this is a cannon fodder, whipping boy political issue, red meat, uh, that the Republicans use consistently. And what happens is that the interject the political fear factor, and then nobody wants to deal with it. I think we have to, do we want common sense solutions on the border? Do, and you know, I've come from a comprehensive approach. I still believe in it, but even incremental pragmatic steps to dealing with, and I do consider it a, 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 a crisis on the border uh, and, and, and a growing crisis. Who are the people that are being apprehended? Who are the people that Ducey's putting on a bus and sending somewhere? They're coming from Central America, Venezuela, Cuba, Haiti, Brazil. You know, interestingly enough, all those governments have authoritarian uh, systems. They don't have democracies. And as a consequence, Nicaragua being another example, Salvador, whose civil society has fallen apart, that's who's coming to the border, okay? And uh, seeking refuge, seeking escape, uh, whatever it is. And there has to be some practice. There are solutions. You don't give up on the issue of security, but you do begin to resource the border the way it should be resourced, to process, to deal with credible fear, assess that. We're not doing that. And we're not doing that because you're trying to build up a system that was basically destroyed over the, last, the course of the last four years. So it's about solution base. And in that solution base, it's gonna be a compromise. I know that. And it's gonna be difficult choices that I have to confront and others that might not agree with me on it have to confront. And the fear to do that is, is it's what's holding any real progress. It seems that the, if we make the situation worse, it gives the Republicans a political advantage. And, and Democrats, some, uh, don't wanna touch that issue. It's too volatile for them politically. 
And so at some point, there has to be some rational discussion about what it means economically, what it means in terms of security, and what it means to the health and welfare of the borderlands in period. And uh, one thing we're missing is the, the really going after organized crime on both sides of the border. The ones that send munitions and guns there and other things, and the ones that are bringing dope and people into this country. That's organized. We're good at that. At uh, our law enforcement agency, that's a concentration point that I still believe we're missing. You talk about weapons going south. Recently, the Mexican government filed in federal court in Tucson against five gun shops, one in Yuma, three in Tucson, that they say are allowing guns to be sold that go south of the border. Is there anything that the federal government can do or a member of Congress can do to, to stop that flow of guns going south? Yes, particularly in a country that... Uh that doesn't accept that, that there's very gun conscious and it's very hard for citizens to acquire firearms in Mexico. So that illicit trade that's going on uh, is, is very dangerous, both for Mexico and for our side and for the United States. And I, 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 I think Congress has to do first. The administration has to really amped up uh, alcohol, firearms and tobacco inf uh, agents uh, that they got destroyed because the NRA and Trump decided that they were gonna undo that agency and they were very effective in reducing its capacity and its ability. I think you could build that up and that's what I meant about organized. These are not accidents. These are calculated ways to get arms over there through a middleman and the people that sell it, uh, although they can say I bear no responsibility, this is a free market, people came and bought a gun. Well, there is a, there is a role that they play in terms of reporting, identifying, you know, somebody coming in and buying 12 automatic weapons should be a hint that it's not something that is a, a normal purchase uh, by a person that is uh, qualified, doing it legally, and doing it for protection or recreation or hunting. That's fine. This other aspect we have to deal with, and the NRA feels that that's an infringement on the Second Amendment. It's not, and, uh, and, and has resisted any attempt to do that. You mentioned mining in conjunction with water. Your opponent is a big proponent of, of mining, expanding it for the economic reasons, it says they recycle 75% of their water. I understand you disagree with that. Oh, that's it. You know, it's it, it's kind of a uh, mining association talking points. You know, we have the best technology. Uh, we remediate all, any any disturbance we create. Uh, the water we use is recycled. You look at all the revenue we bring you, and look at the jobs we bring you. So that offsets any loss on this end. That's not true. We're in the twenty. We're, mining is based on an eighteen seventy five law and all the power to the mining company and no power to, to the public through the representatives. So that needs to change. And then what also needs to change is that for God's sakes, one, they don't pay one penny in royalty on everything they extract from, from public lands. That needs to stop as well. There has to be a return so that we can deal with abandoned mines and, and pollution that has been caused by that. And so it's, it's a big lie in that sense that we keep repeating the thing over and over and over again. Uh, it's, it's a low, this is not about stopping mining. It's about bringing mining into this century. And in this century, it means options. It means public input. And it means accountable and measurable uh, results. And, 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 that's not possible now with the law that we have in place. They have all the cards and the rest of us, all we're left with, as you'll notice, all the controversies, whether it's resolution, whether it is whatever mine you talk about. The controversy stems from the fact the public didn't know until the last minute, and here we are. Let's talk about the big Supreme Court decision this summer, Dobbs, rolling back Roe v. Wade. Does Congress need to do something 
or should they leave the abortion decisions to the states the way we're operating right now? If I believe strongly, and I think most Americans do, that, that a woman's decision on her reproductive status, even involving abortion, is her decision. That that is a fundamental human right. And if we believe that, and we should, because what we don't want from Dobbs is to create a whole sub second class citizenship for the women of this nation. And so if we, I think we need to nationalize it, codify those protections, Roe versus Wade into law plus others and make it the law of the land. Because not because you're usurping from the states, what you're doing is that you are protecting a human right, just like we did with the Civil Rights Act, just like we did with a uh, woman's right to vote and the amendment that had to be done there. And so, and just as we're, we returned the right of, of uh, Native Americans to vote after 1948, these were legislative fixes to bad Supreme Court decisions. Dobbs is a bad Supreme Court decision. The only body that can correct it is Congress. All right, well, thanks for spending some time with us. Not a problem. It's been good, thank you. When the Independent Redistricting Commission reorganized the state's political boundaries, they put all of the ports of entry for Arizona in the seventh district. That means whomever is elected will represent the majorities of Arizona's border communities and cross-border trade. Republican Luis Pozzolo is challenging Grijalva. He's new to Arizona politics and is here with Christopher Conover. Chris? Thanks. So the obvious place to start with this is, you're not a career politician, why run for Congress? Well, I think it's um, a lot of problems. We have a lot of problems, especially in the District 7. Um, I think my experience in business and my life experience uh, is very important to play a, you know, a key role into the district to bring improvement to the district. We have a lot of problems. We have border problems, we have drugs uh, problem, unemployment issues, uh, criminality is, 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 you know, the homeless issues. There are too many problems. You know, coming from a country that, you know, went through the same process, um, I, I decided to, and I was lucky to have a place to come, and that was America. America gave me a second, second chance, and I see this country going through the same process. That's what they called me to get into politics. If people don't know your background, you mentioned you emigrated to the U.S., you're in business. Give us a little bit of your background. Well, um, you know, in, back in South America, I was uh, in federal banking for 12, 13 years. Uh, two of those years, I, I, I worked in the capital in, in Uruguay. My father was a politician. Uh, when I came to America, I started from scratch. You know, I came here. Um, you, ha you have no, you know, work history. history. Uh, banking didn't pay very well over here, so I started from scratch as a dishwasher. Uh, move, uh, work uh, as a recruiter for Toyota, um, and after that, I worked for a railroad company. Uh, you know, I started as an admin. I finished being safety and training director for that company for six years. And I worked for a biotechnology company. Um, I got certified by Microsoft, and we did a lot of uh, implementations in Canada, US, and, and Latin America. Um, and after that, I, I got into, you know, the meat business and distribution. And I started again from scratch in that company. Six months after that, I was director of operation um, and general manager for the Georgia facility. And then I came to Arizona and I was general manager here. And I decided to open my own business. You know, I said, you know, I'm spending too long away from family. My daughter was growing. I, I have a daughter is 18 now. Uh, and I'm going to spend more time. So we opened our first business in, in Maricopa City. Everybody told, oh, no, you're not going to succeed there. And we did very well there. And I went to Fountain Hills, which is next to, to Scottsdale. And we opened another business there, which was very successful, too. So we have, you know, the perfect immigrant American dream story in life with my family. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's time to do the same for other people. So if you're elected in November, sworn in in January, what's the first bill you're gonna file? When I get elected in November, I think the best thing we need to do is cut regulations. Everybody talk about writing more bills and writing more bills, and we get too many of those bills. Uh, and the red tape, I, I think we need to go to Washington and see how we simplify everything. I think it's too complicated. It's too many bills. 
Uh, my number one goal is to stop the spending. I think, you know, the budget needs to be, you know, we have no a real budget for 20 years. We have not been able to balance a budget. And this become a monster where you have politicians in, in Washington that are spending crazy amount of money, money we don't have. Uh, you know, where, you know, the deficit on the federal budget is a trillion dollars. Uh, we're printing money like crazy. We are asking other countries for money. Um, so my goal over there is, is being able to, you know, st stop the spending and doing that, we are going to bring the inflation back. Um, and after that, work with local state and, and, you know, and the counties to, you know, cut regulations so we can bring business back to, to America. Well, to my district. The 7th Congressional District been redrawn along with all of them. Now it includes all the ports of entry for Arizona and almost the entire border. You've been critical of your opponent when it comes to the border. What does Congress need to do about the border? Well, I think any country has the right to have control of their own border. Right now, this administration has no control of what is happening in the border. And we are not talking the people that come every day to work in farms uh, or people that are decent people coming to work. That has been happening for 250 years. Uh, that relationship between the two communities, we cannot ignore, even when we have a wall in the middle, these two communities interact every day. Um, and I learned that, you know, spending a lot of time going, going into these communities and going into Mexico and talking with the Mexican authorities and brokers. Um, but, the, you know, I think we need to stop, you know, the, the, the madness and, and the border. We, we you know, can't, uh, we are not sustainable. This system is not sustainable when you open the border to everybody. I was talking with people in Tijuana yesterday. There are 1,000 you know, 10, uh, to 20,000 Venezuelans over there waiting because this, um, this administration said, oh, yeah, come over. Um, the fentanyl, it, it became one of the biggest issues uh, at the border, and the cartels are operating uh, you know, northern and northern into our district. You know, I, I get a lot of information from cameras that people have in the border, and you see... Uh, we never see this before where, you know, two or three o'clock in the afternoon, the border, you know, the, the cartels are coming through our border. They are fighting miles inside our border with no problem, you know, with AK-47s and, you know, 1911s in, in their belts. It never happened before. You know, we need to stop the anarchy and have a system which is sustainable. I'm an immigrant. I believe in immigration, but you need to have a process and, be, and we need to have an order in how we do that. When it comes to the initial stopping people coming across the border, every president I've covered since I've been in Arizona, which started with George W. Bush, has always said more border patrol agents. But that number has stayed pretty steady at 19,000 for years. Is more boots on the ground, as people like to say? Is that the answer? And how do we get them? Well, um, I think, you know, according with the numbers I have seen, they, a lot of people retire in the last two years. They, according with the Border Patrol sources I have, they are talking about they lost around 15, 20 percent of the force. Uh, plus, you know, you took around 20, 30 percent of the people to do paperwork for asylees um, and you move the Border Patrol away from the border. A lot of the Border Patrol, you know, Casa Grande, Tucson, I think we need to bring back Border Patrol to do border work at the border. Uh, we need to give them more resources. We need to uh, maybe change the shifting, you know, maybe, you know, they, they have three uh, shift days. Uh, I think we need to go probably to, you know, like firefighters. Yeah, they can spend three or four days. We need to have their areas in, in our border here in Arizona in National Forest that you don't have border patrol covering. I have walked those cartel trails over there. There are more than 120 cartel trails in the Aribaca area where you, you maybe see one or two trucks from Border Patrol driving around, but you, know, you don't see any boots on the ground. At the border, we know where the gaps are, you know, where these people are crossing. If I know that, they know. But, you know, basically, you know, I think it's a demoralization in Border Patrol where they can basically, well, these are the laws and these are the rules, but you cannot enforce them. So, we, we, you know, we're facing a problem where, where Border Patrol, like police in Tucson, well, the laws are there, but if I enforce the laws, I get in trouble, and that needs to change. Earlier this year, the U.S. Supreme Court issued the Dobbs ruling, which got rid of Roe versus Wade. We now have 50 states trying to figure it out. Does the federal government need to come in with one specific law? And if they do, what should that law be? I believe uh, every state has the right to take their own decisions. I don't think we can federalize. Uh, you know, that's exactly what the Supreme Court said. You know, the federal government had no right. They didn't ban abortion. They just said the federal 
government have no right to intercede into the abortion laws that the state should have. I think it's a state issue, and every state has the right to take their own decisions. I have my personal opinion, but you know, uh, I'm running for Congress, it's a federal position. I don't think the federal government should be involved in that. You mentioned mining earlier. What needs to be done with mining? It's big business here in Arizona, but a lot of folks, including your opponent, talk about the environmental impacts. How do you balance those two? Well, um, the question you need to ask, and I, I said this to Raul Grijalva in, in one of the debates, you talk about environmental issues and the environmental issues are global. Who can extract those minerals? We need the minerals. We cannot have, a, a, you know, even if you, keep pushing with a new green deal, you need copper to build those electric cars. Where that copper is coming from? Who can extract that copper you know, safer? America with you know, EPA and all the regulations that we have, or Africa or Afghanistan or China. And right now we're buying all those minerals, a lot of those minerals from those countries where you know, hundreds of thousands of people die in the mines and we don't even know. Um, I, I think we know we, at the same time, we need to create jobs in America. We cannot become consumers. And that's what we do. And, and, and Raul, for 20 years, has been fighting mining. You have mining projects here. They've been here for 10 years, and they keep, you know, uh, lawsuits and you know new regulations, trying to make these businesses go away. But we need a copper. We really need it. You know, even you know, uh, you get older and you say, well, I need a heap replacement. Okay, you're gonna do a metal one. You need titanium for that. Where it's coming from? It comes from mining. Well, if you want a plastic one, it comes from oil. Uh, the 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 new Green Deal that Grijalva support and been supporting for 20 years is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. You, you know, and we can see that when they push a new Green Deal and try to get that out, uh, out of uh, fossil fuels. Um, and basically now we're paying the price. And who's paying the price? The people in our district making $25,000, $50,000. That people are paying the price. And now they're realizing, well, we push too hard. So we need to be sustainable. This is not about pink unicorns. Uh, this is about reality, and you have people that are living in our district. They're suffering with inflation and the gas prices. Uh, if, if the future are the electric cars, I don't think that's a near future because the, the, the you know, batteries need to be lighter, the battery need to be smaller, um, the charging time need to be faster. We are not there yet. So you 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 know you're sacrificing a lot of people that are suffering right now with inflation and gas prices just because you want to push your agenda. I'm not going to Washington to pull any agenda paid by any super PACs or any lobbies. Um, Raul uh, claimed that his money doesn't come from PACs. Well, 40% of his money in 2021 and 2022 came from PACs. So we need to start looking into that people, uh, like uh, you know this uh, nonprofit organization they're donating to him, and I have done that. You find, for example, Richard H. Lawrence Jr., who you know is a Californian, but he's a guru investor in Asia with six four point four billion dollar invested over there. So what Raul is doing, getting money from this guy? I'm going to Washington to find solution, real solution for Americans. And, and mining, you know, we need those minerals. We cannot live without that. And if we can extract it here, we can create jobs over here, we can do it safer here, why not? All right, well, thanks for spending some time with us. Thank you. To learn more about the candidates for the 7th Congressional District and all of the issues on the ballot, make sure to visit our website. One of the major topics in the race for Arizona governor is how to handle the state's border with Mexico. But how much power does the state have on an issue that's regulated at the federal level? In this installment of our Fact Check Arizona segment, we look at how the proposed policies of the gubernatorial candidates contradict with federal law. When Carrie Lake and Katie Hobbs appeared on CBS's Face the Nation recently, the topic that took up the most time was how to handle immigration and security along Arizona's border with Mexico. Hobbs largely centered on both parties' failure to find a solution at the federal level. Trump centered his whole immigration policy around finishing the wall, and it's not done. And um, But Biden does need to step up immigration and border security, absolutely. Uh, Arizona is bearing the brunt of, of um, illegal drug trafficking, gun trafficking, and smuggling, uh, and we do need more border security. This echoes policy ideas on her campaign website, which stresses the need to lobby at the federal level and work with federal authorities to find a solution. That falls in line with what Lynn Marcus, a clinical law professor at the University of Arizona, told AZPM is possible at the federal level. 
She says state laws and lawsuits over immigration and border security have been a losing battle in federal courts since the 1990s. That includes Arizona's battle over the controversial Senate Bill 1070. In the Arizona versus United States case back in 2012, 10 years ago, the Supreme Court ruled that the supremacy clause of the Constitution means that the federal government has broad powers over immigration law enforcement, and states don't. As for solutions on the state level, Hobbs promises increased resources to local law enforcement near the border, as well as for medical facilities and community centers. She says those entities often deal with the crisis firsthand and deserve more assistance because of it. Republican Kerry Lake's platform, on the other hand, is more direct. Of course, if you know the Constitution, you know that Article 4, Section 4 calls for the federal government to protect us from invasion. And under Joe Biden's lack of leadership, we just aren't seeing that. And we have an invasion at our border, the cartels. These narco-terrorist groups have operational control, and they're using Arizona to smuggle people, to traffic children, and to traffic the most dangerous drug we've ever seen, fentanyl. The section of the Constitution that Lake cites is commonly known as the Guarantee Clause, and grants states protections to ensure that power remains in the hands of the people. That includes protections against foreign invasion and violence from within the country. Lynn Marcus says that guarantee has routinely been seen as referring to a foreign government. There is a limited circumstances in which states can declare an invasion under the Constitution, and that's when there's been an invasion by a foreign power, and the federal government has not come to the state's protection. And while criminal enterprises like cartels that smuggle drugs or people across the border are organized and powerful, they do not meet the definition of a foreign power. Marcus also says federal courts have declined invasion cases in the past. The courts can't decide uh, when there's been an invasion and when there hasn't. It's up to the federal government to decide this because there's really, there are really no manageable standards to determine when it is and, and when it isn't. And this has been the agreement of other circuit courts as well. An overarching reason that these decisions are kept at the federal level is international diplomacy. A state making a decision about a neighboring country could have dire consequences on the relationship between that country and the U.S. Keep up with all of our fact checks by subscribing to our fact check podcast on our website. And that's our show for this week. I'm Liliana Soto. Thanks for watching.